Welcome to Travis Smith, and more particularly, welcome to this Bingham event. Uh, I'm uh, Chris Hale, and um, I wasn't until recently senior partner of Travis Smith. I now have a title that the academics in the audience will appreciate, which is Chair Emeritus. <laughs> um, most of my practicing life, I've been a mergers and acquisitions lawyer, um, uh, almost exclusively within the private equity space, if the term private equity means anything to you. Um, I've often reflected on um, uh, the importance as a building block of the rule of law for the success of private equity um, in Western democracies. Um, after all, uh, if you're a party and you can't rely on the other parties to a contract complying with it, and you don't have a judicial system, a legal system, if they don't comply with the contract, to which you can refer, but you and the other parties regard as fair, uh, independent, and impartial, and whose judgments you expect all parties to respect, and which everybody has access to, what do you do? Well, the answer in some countries, actually, is you resort to violence. Now, it's not just private equity um, that relies on the rule of law for its success. In my view, it's the whole of the success of Western economies and Western democracies. Um, I s uh, spend a bit of time uh, speaking at schools on the subject of the rule of law. I do it through a charity that the journalist Robert Peston set up, Speakers for Schools. And I commend it to you, anybody that is interested in talking to students outside the Bingham programme. Um, I come away from these talks um, always reflecting on the fact that um, the rule of law as a concept and its significance is not at all understood, not just by pupils at schools, but by their teachers. Um, and now is a vital time to educate our citizens about what the rule of law is and why it is so significant. I say that because populism is on the rise in Western democracies, um, and with it comes a cavalier attitude to the rule of law, in some cases actively hostile. And that is the case in uh, countries like uh, the UK and the US, which one thinks of as the nurturing ground of the key pillars to the rule of law. Um, was uh, the recent US assassination of Soleimani in accordance with international rule of law? Well, I very much doubt it. Um, Bingham is doing quite a lot of work on the withdrawal bill currently before Parliament and looking at it from a rule of law perspective. And it is coming up short in some important respects. So now is a vital time to think about the subject that's before you this evening. Uh, we as a firm at Travis Smith are delighted to support <coughs> the education programme of the Bingham Centre for all the reasons I've uh, just articulated. So that's enough from me. Over to you, Michael, and do enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you again for the firm's generous support for the Rule of Law for Citizenship Education Programme. We couldn't achieve the scale of impact we do without you. So I'd like to thank colleagues, friends, supporters for joining us for what I hope is a really stimulating evening, reflecting on democracy, rights and the rule of law. I'll briefly go over what we're going to be up to this evening. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Bingham Centre because some of the people in this room have come from interactions on specific programmes but not necessarily engaged with the Bing Centre as a whole. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the headline concepts, what exactly we mean when we talk about citizenship and the rule of law, because both of those terms can evoke some quite evocative responses without people always having the, sh the same shared understanding whenever they meet to discuss them. Throughout all of the presentations, we're going to hear from expert speakers who are absolute leaders in their fields and I'm very delighted to be joined by some of the key players in citizenship and the rule of law in our country. Thank you very much to all of our speakers for joining us. 
We're then going to reflect a little bit on the type of citizenship education that the Bingham Centre has been delivering for five years, whilst talking about some of the lessons that we've learned, speaking to the students, the beneficiaries and youth organisations, and the educators who have been at the forefront of this programme. I'll go over a few of the headline statistics that we've got, so you can actually look with some depth at who received the citizenship education. After that, we're going to hear about how other approaches across the civil service and government should be engaging in a meaningful way with people's protected characteristics and the types of disadvantages that they face in order to ensure that everybody receives the universality of children's rights and fairness in their lives. And then... The big product for 2020 is going to be released. <laughs> really looking forward to that. So if that sounds like a, a cool agenda, and I should say we do get some cool drinks and canapes at the end of that, <laughs> I'll get cracking. So before we kick off, I'd like people to be brave, as, the, as tonight is about courage and standing up for yourself and, 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 and voicing what you hold dearly. What do we think the rule of law means? Can we have a couple of contributions from the audience? And I don't want anybody who's written a textbook about that to speak. <laughs> Daniel. Justice and equality. Those are really headline concepts for us at the Bingham <laughs> Centre. And when we start to introduce this area in schools, particularly terms that we like to foreground, fresh stuff. What else have we got? Right about me. A system of control. I like that, you're thinking radically. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we've always foregrounded the notions that the rule of law in some of the senses and some of the descriptions that people might want to use it need not necessarily always serve the, the, the best intentions. There have been a couple of statements over the last couple of years from leaders of very strong Western European countries where they've sought to use the rule of law in senses and areas where we may not necessarily agree with the substance of the decisions that are being made. And, and again, I can see in those instances how it might be seen as a, as a system of control. What else have we got up here at the front? Fairness, equal treatment. Absolutely. And I like how Daniel referred to equality, but you referred to equal treatment. One of the things that we really delve into in, in the course is how the notion of equality before the law has often included some really quite problematic concepts and ideas that haven't res resulted in people receiving equal treatment. One of the big lessons that we have in the course is a historical journey from the moment that America abolishes slavery to the moment in the 1950s when black people actually feel that they're treated equally before the law. And that journey really charts how equal treatment in that jurisdiction didn't necessarily mean equality. There was a US doctrine of separate but equal that really saw a lot of resources taken away from marginalised communities whilst notionally saying that they respected equality. I'll take one from Jack and then, I'll, then we'll move on. I was going to say it's a practical and evolving concept. Absolutely, so it's not fixed. The, the first thinker that is mentioned in the massive open online course is Aristotle. And I, uh, <laughs> I've coined a title for a lecture, The Rule of Law Today from Aristotle to Ulla Tukun. <laughs> <laughs> to represent the idea that there are certainly people who are thinking and writing about this today. <laughs> All right, so I'd, I'd like to briefly explain what BIICL is, what the Bingham Centre is, how these organisations came about and what we are. So you'll see over there uh, a very pretty uh, 60th anniversary banner. That's how long we've been around. The British Institute of International and Comparative Law was, fine, was founded in 1958 by a fusion of two very well respected international law societies as an independent research body, unaffiliated to any, any university, any government, any private institution, committed to the understanding, development and practical application of international and comparative law. 
More recently, in 2010, as I'll call it from now, Bickle, that's the British Institute of International Comparative Law, <sighs> Bickle, <laughs> founded the Bingham Centre to capture the enthusiasm generated by Lord Bingham in his book, The Rule of Law, that many perceive to be that clarifying, unifying concept of what the rule of law might mean. So I briefly want to outline what Lord Bingham expressed in his book so that we can work on a shared understanding of the headline concept we're discussing today, the rule of law. Now, Lord Bingham set out eight principles, and in much of the work that the Bingham Centre does, these eight principles influence our work. First of all, Lord Bingham said that the law should be clear, accessible, and practical. And there are many aspects that one might draw from that. The idea that over-legislation and over juridification producing hundreds of statutes, thousands of statutory instruments, might lead to people not necessarily knowing what the law is in their situation, and that that might not be rule of law compliant. The second idea, and we've had two contributions on this already, is that the law should apply equally to all. However, there may be objective differences that mean it's actually treating people differently that gives effect to equality. And those deep ideas of how resources should be spent, how you might, for example, in this country through the Equality Act, have particular provisions that give people with disabilities, for example, advantages in order to enable them to participate in the same way as others, is a really meaningful rule of law analysis to the equality question. The third aspect, which I think is certainly a concept at the forefront of many public lawyers' minds, is the notion that government decision makers, civil servants, should exercise their powers for the reason that those powers were given, acting within them, and exercising them for good faith. The fourth idea was that it's the law and not discretion that should be the primary basis for deciding on people's rights and entitlements. So those four ideas make up a real central core of the rule of law that quite a few people might say is the formal sense of the rule of law. But Lord Bingham wanted more than that because he said that in diverse societies where minority groups might have decisions and laws imposed on them by a majority, there has to be something more that actually protects people from that tyranny of the majority. And he thought law had a role to play in all of that. So for him, there had to be processes by which people could actually challenge decisions that were made about them. The fifth aspect was that where those decisions are being made, be they in courts or tribunals, they should be fair. Fairness in adjudication and fairness in trials. And beyond that, People should have the ability to resolve disputes that arise between them and their neighbour, them and their community, them and their employer, them and their government. Because if people aren't actually able to enforce the rights they have, all of the other stuff we're talking about is meaningless. And access to justice is at the core of my work on a daily basis. The seventh aspect was that there should be respect for fundamental human rights. And I've had rich debates with colleagues in the Bingham Centre as to which fundamental rights should be included in that. And the eighth, acknowledging that no country and no state can ever truly have got it right. And the compliance with international legal standards enables us to be in a position where people are treated fairly and protected. So, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to briefly talk about how all of that fits with citizenship. When people hear the word citizenship, they often think of passports, they think of immigration, they think of refugees. And whilst those are very important issues that are considered by colleagues across Bickle, when I talk about citizenship in terms of the citizenship and rule of law programme, it's talking about a sense of participation in law and politics. It's talking about a sense of identity a sense of belonging, feeling that you're a member of a unit. And the example that I often talk about and the feature in the course is that I have multiple spheres of belonging. I'm a member of this community, Legal London. I'm a citizenship educator. I'm a Brummie. 
And <laughs> at some stage in that list of priorities, British as well. I'm a Nigerian and increasingly keep telling myself um, I, I am. And all of those multiple spheres of identity are the way that I construct and perceive my own citizenship. And then there's the subjects. There's this beautiful thing that enables people to critically debate different notions of how resources should be spent, what their community should look like, and what decisions should come out of the public policy machine. A subject that empowers young people who are not going to be sitting in parliament, not going to be making high level decisions in the civil service, to actually put together different conceptions of what the world should look like. And citizenship education for me has always been one of, the, one of the most powerful tools that can break away differences and barriers of ideology and religion to have people talking in a civil or constructive manner about how things can be improved. And there's a lot to say about constructing solutions that everybody wants and everybody's contributed to. We're told by the UN Commission on the Legal Empowerment of the Poor that up to 4 billion people, so just over 55% of the world's population, are robbed of the opportunity to better their lives because they don't feel the benefits of the rule of law. And those people are everywhere. They're people in our communities. They're people we cross across when we're walking across the street. They're as a report from the Legal Services Board will tell us, up to 36% of the English population. And it's often been said, and this is something that I draw from colleagues in our Reconnect, Reconcile Europe with its Citizens Through Democracies project, that by instilling certain values and skills and capabilities in people, you can enable them to go to that decision maker and tell them you actually shouldn't have made this decision about me and this is how it should have been. You can work with people who may not understand you or your background to construct something in the community that's beautiful. And much of the work that I've been able and privileged to do in this space has been exactly that. Working with the organisation Citizens UK, there were a few issues that people experienced in the city of Nottingham they were quite thorny, complex and difficult. 16 and 17 year olds who weren't being treated as homeless for the purposes of the Children Act. A bunch of hate crime incidents with no specific individual at the council who <coughs> actually had responsibility for those incidents. And a whole host of very malignant actions being committed by landlords against their tenants. And powerful citizenship action in that case looked like holding political assemblies where we get prospective parliamentary candidates and leaders of the council on stage with ordinary working class people telling their stories and actually achieving meaningful policy concessions as a result of that. But citizenship action will look different to everybody and for me that's the beauty of it all. So you might ask what does this actually have to do with the root of the organ? <laughs> A recent paper by Dr. Doyle Stebick, which I thought was quite instructive in this area, was a brief summary of research he'd done on Poland and Hungary, states which are often said to be examples of post-Soviet states that have become democratic, that recently have seen substantial rule of law backsliding. And he said, there's an elite conversation going on you might well attribute the actions of the Law and Justice Party or Victor Orban for this rule of law backsliding. But how many of their voters express rule of law concerns at these rallies that they're holding? <clears throat> how many of the student activists in the universities are convening groups to discuss these actions? And his conclusion was essentially that the preservation of the rule of law in countries is less about the elite conversations between the lawyers and the politicians that the journalists are sometimes involved in, and all about building a rule of law ethos where ordinary people actually care about the way that decisions are being made in their states. 
And education can be viewed as a lever by which you can get to a place where you build a rule of culture within the citizenry. There are loads of colleagues here who run citizenship programmes and have been involved in human rights education projects where they've taken beneficiaries who feel that politics and the law are completely away from them, have never resulted in a concession in their favour, and taken them along a journey of engagement where at the end they've been working with politicians, lobbying them, holding surgeries, having young people's voices heard. And that, for me, is what a radical conception of the rule of law for the 21st century looks like. So that's my enthusiasm for citizenship and what I think it could be. And I think the unfortunate reality, as suggested by the Ad Hoc Select Committee on Citizenship and Civic Engagement in the Lords, now a couple of years ago, it's 2020, isn't it? In their 2018 report, The Ties That Bind, was that citizenship education in England is in a parlous state. Quite damning words. And that committee had very senior lawyers like Lord Hodgson on it, and also had Lord Blunkett, who was probably the key figure in making this happen in this country. So I think you can understand that it's quite a damning judgment and indictment. The government's response was that citizenship continues to be one of only a few subjects that are compulsory in the national curriculum at Key Stage 4, and that schools aren't teaching citizenship as they're not obliged to in academies and free schools. It's a choice that they've made in respect of their local cultural traditions and their ability to design their own curricula, etc. Now, I was very critical of, of that position when I made my submission and took a steer from Liz, who is probably the UK's leading authority on this issue. Liz has had a career where she's essentially followed and tracked the development of citizenship education in England, having been part of the original conversations, working to support educators across the country as it was implemented, and continuing to fight the good fight to make it to try to build a being a country where everybody benefits from this fantastic subject. So without further ado, I'd like to get Liz on stage to say a few words. It's always difficult to follow Michael because <laughs> he's such an engaging expert himself. And, I have an um, recommendation. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for that introduction. I'm um, humbled by it, and uh, I don't feel like whatever it was you just described me as. I just feel like a foot soldier that believes in something and has tried to do my part in making it a reality for more children and young people in this country. But um, So I'm going to talk a little bit about citizenship education and the rule of law. Um, I, I'll apologise up front to those people who know you well, you've probably heard it all before, but to those who don't, um, maybe something that I say will be new. Um, ACT is um, what we call a subject association, so we're a, an organisation, a charity, um, comprising of teachers and educators who do our bit to support schools um, with teaching of the subject. We lobby those in power. Um, to try to persuade them to put policy and resources our way so that more citizenship education happens. And, um, and we work with lots of different organisations like um, the Bingham Centre. And we can't do our work without colleagues like Michael and others in the room. So we're very much a kind of collaborative organisation. So I think you have been looking at our mission statement for a few minutes. Um, and it's a pretty tall order, um, but basically our belief is that to create this vibrant democracy based on equality, fairness and justice, and of course human rights, um, we really need a strong citizenship education, um, and that the best way of achieving that is to work systematically with teachers and schools. So there's lots of organisations that do what we sort of call direct delivery work. So they'll go in, they'll do something with students for a day or two, 
Um, sometimes it will happen over a longer period and then they'll go away again. But our belief to create real change is that you need to be systematic in how you work with people and to build a kind of cadre of citizenship teachers who are enthusiasts and supporters and advocates of the subject who in turn create the young citizens who are a bit more politically engaged and informed, a bit more legally literate, a bit more economically literate. And so we believe that confidence boosting, capacity building and subject knowledge of teachers is the way forward and that's why we focus on citizenship teaching. So just a quick recap of Michael very kindly covered a little bit of this. Citizenship is a national curriculum subject, um, started in 2002. We're non-statutory, so not compulsory in primary schools, but there is a national framework that schools can use to develop their curriculum. In secondary schools, we are a statutory national curriculum subject. But again, as Michael said, not every secondary school has to follow the national curriculum because academies and free schools have a choice about whether they follow it. And we're also a GCSE qualification. Now, I told my colleagues when I got here to remind me to put my glasses on so I can read some notes that I prepared. You failed, maybe. But I'll put my glasses on so I can properly see what I'm, um, what I'm talking to. So we're a subject that I like to call multidisciplinary. So we touch on and our roots are in the disciplines of politics, law, economics and sociology. And um, the subject teaches big concepts and big areas of knowledge and understanding about democracy, about how government works, about human rights, about law and the rule of law, about uh, issues of identity, diversity and equality in society. And it does that and brings that to life through real issues and controversial discussions and debates and getting children really engaged in the subject matter in an active way. So our key aim is to develop informed, active and responsible citizens who are prepared to speak out, play their part, stand up against inequality and be a, a part of a thriving democratic society so that they develop the skills and capacities to hold those in power to account, to get involved in making real change. And when it comes to teaching and learning about the law, rights, human rights and the rule of law, we basically want to build key understandings. We can't do everything. You know, there's a limited amount of time that schools have and certainly a very limited amount of time that schools have for subjects like citizenship. But in a good uh, rich citizenship education uh, curriculum, they will develop a knowledge and understanding of democracy, how the law helps us resolve issues and problems in communities and society, how the justice system works, particularly in relation to young people, why an independent judiciary is important and access to justice um, if we're going to shore up democracy and ensure fairness and protect vulnerable people and minorities and the marginalised in society. So we want to build some of those key understandings and actually the, the kind of eight principles, I mean they are perfect really for citizenship teachers to work with um, if they have the time and the capacity and the resources and the subject knowledge. So I think one of the fantastic things about the MOOC, we're all really excited and I've had a little glimpse of Michael in action, is it's going to be a real source of inspiration. They're going to love Michael uh, talking to them about this stuff. Can we, can we have that quote for the <laughs> slide that quote. on Twitter as well? Yeah. But we also want students to build their essential skills. So we want them to be able to research, to think critically, to weigh evidence, to make a case, substantiate their views, to deliberate and debate with others and to represent points of view they might not necessarily agree with. These are the kind of democratic capacities and skills that we're trying to build. And the very best teachers use real examples, real legal cases, real human rights cases, and develop kind of it real deep, uh, engaged, active learning to build their students' knowledge and understanding. And where they can, they work with the law sector, they work with the police, they work with law firms and law experts, maybe bringing them into school, as we heard 
um, from the first gentleman that spoke. The professions going into schools is a really um, empowering way for children to engage with people from the law profession. And I kind of believe that, yes, yeah, citizenship is a general education. It is for every citizen. But some of them will be the Michaels of the future, the barristers of the future, the politicians of the future. So I slightly disagree with your point, Michael, when you said they won't be in Parliament or senior civil servants. They will be the Gillians of the DfE in the future and the Michaels and others. So I, I hold out every hope. The best schools teach this subject in a range of ways, as a discrete subject with separate <coughs> lessons, through other subjects, and using focus days, and often using um, experts and practitioners to come in and support their teaching. And the stronger schools are those where the head teachers are behind this, they really back it, and the parents and governors understand what the subject is. The problem is too often, that isn't happening. So citizenship becomes weak, disorganised, dispersed through lots of curriculum subjects without proper planning, and ultimately disappears from the curriculum. And that's tragic, and children are missing out on this fundamental entitlement to education. Now citizenship is 18 years old this September. So like all teenagers, it's been through its tricky phase, particularly probably the last 10 years, with feelings of uncertainty about the future, a feeling of not being listened to by those in authority, having an identity but nobody understands who it is or who we are, and not being very loved, frankly. And we need government and those in power to show us a bit more love. So we need a bit more investment, more public policies that support this area of education. We need to rebuild the infrastructure for the subject. The statistics are quite bold. Um, since 2010, there's been a decline by about 50% of the number of teachers teaching citizenship in our schools, from around 10,000 to around four and a half from DfE workforce statistics. And the numbers training as specialist citizenship teachers have declined sharply, not least because there is no government funding to support trainee citizenship teachers, unlike there is for most subjects. And there's currently absolutely no investment in continuing professional development for existing teachers. So this is all at a time when democracy is going through, let's face it, unprecedented challenges. And whilst many are standing up and saying, we need more of this citizenship and democracy education because this is the route to change in society. It's the route to building a strong, vibrant democracy in the future. And again, as Michael referred to, the chair of the Lords Committee made this sort of powerful statement that individuals do not learn about government and political institutions by osmosis, they need to be taught and taught well. And the neglect of citizenship education is, in recent years is much to be regretted. But in spite of all these problems and challenges, we're determined the subject will flourish. As a young adult, we're reaching 18 this September and we want to make that real and powerful difference. And there are some fantastic teachers working in schools who are really committed to this subject. Some of them are now working with us as regional ambassadors in different parts of the country, trying to share their practice with others. So while there are many challenges, and ACT is a small charity uh, with very, very limited resources, we're determined to do this better and make sure that more children get their entitlement to citizenship, to rule of law, to human rights education. Now, Michael told me on the phone, I don't know if this is still true, Michael, so you can shut me up if you like. Your textbook, I think you said to me, you sort of want to say farewell to it, and your move is the <laughs> all new fancy digital thing. Well, I'd like to make a plea, because I think there's still really good things in your textbook, and I think we could use it in new ways. So can we have a chat about that, please? Because some of my teachers yes, are quite yeah. upset I, I to hear. I've a private chat that we don't yeah. talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, I thought 
so it's a friendly audience. <laughs> that was right. We love the idea of the MOOC, by the way. Digital is the way forward. And we've just started doing CPD online, and it's proving really popular. So we'd love to work with you on that as well, and we think there are things we can do together. And working together is absolutely the way forward. So a final thing, we need your help. There's lots of people in this room who are experts, who have knowledge, who maybe can support schools with citizenship education on your doorsteps. You've probably got really powerful networks and you can influence people in positions of power who can maybe listen more closely to the arguments for why citizenship education, the rule of law and human rights education is so important. And ultimately, we'd love to welcome you as members of ACT. Anybody can join. Your support is really valuable to us and we hope you'll help us on our journey to securing more high quality citizenship for all young people so we really do build a fairer, more equal, just and democratic society for all. Thank you very much. So that was a very insightful presentation that I think really set out the stall for citizenship education in a really meaningful, accessible and, and practical way. Do we have any questions for Liz about any of that? I think uh, we use politics. Yeah, um, unfortunately I went to one of these academies that didn't offer citizenship uh, mm. as a subject and now obviously I'm kind of feeling like I missed out. Mm. Um, how do you think we should go about <laughs> convincing, you know, um, head teachers that it is a necessary subject, especially at a time of kind of tight budgets and tight uh, teaching uh, presence? I think there's a, there's a number of things we can do. So one of the things we did last year was lobby hard when Ofsted changed its inspection framework to make sure that citizenship was in there as a national curriculum subject that needed to be inspected. Now, it doesn't mean every school inspection will pick up whether citizenship is happening or not, but there's a much better chance of it being looked at. My worry is if Ofsted set a bar too low... Yeah i.e. you can use the dispersed, virtually disappeared model in the curriculum. It's somewhere in other subjects and you can just tick it off. And it's not done rigorously and properly. So I think having the levers in national policy is really important. But ultimately, our next kind of level of lobbying is with head teachers. We need head teachers talking to other head teachers to remind them of the moral purpose of why they went into education in the first place because pretty much most teacher went into education to make the world a better place. That might sound all sort of la di da but I think it's genuine. I think a lot of teachers do become teachers to try and change things through education and to give children knowledge so that they can be the best person that they can be. Um, so we have to do that sort of peer-to-peer -peer marketing. But, you know, this is why my plea to you all, really, everybody can help with this. And it's only through a collective effort we'll really make a difference. Because we're tiny, you know, it's myself, Camilla on the front, one part-time teacher working nationally and internationally. I don't know if Michael mentioned, but I go to the Council of Europe. I work with 48 member states on citizenship, democracy and human rights as well. We're kind of everywhere stretched, Paul, so we really need a collective effort. So I think there's a combination of things. And I'm sure there are lots of others we can do too. I'm, I'm interested in what you said about the sort of lack of political enthusiasm for, for citizenship. I just wanted to ask you to sort of expand why you think that was, particularly in the sense that uh, my general sense is that the Conservative Party in particular is not enthusiastic about it because they see it as something that came from a Labour government and also something that's sort of breeding left-wing activism, basically. I mean, yeah. I just wanted to, is that true? Or it's just a shame, <laughs> but I think you're right. I think some people see it like that, and I think it's a shame, because they've kind of forgotten that this came in with cross-party political support, mm -hmm. because everybody was concerned about a, a cohort of young people who seemed to be terribly politically apathetic, poli particularly in terms of national politics. I think young people have always been engaged with local issues and local politics and now with global issues, you know, the Greta effect, whether you like what she stands for or not, it is huge what one young person seems to have triggered. I'm sure behind the scenes there's lots of infrastructure around that, but anyway. So I think it's a shame that it gets tarnished in that way, 
And I think whether you're kind of of the left or of the right, usually there's a reason you can buy into for why citizenship education is important. Mm. So if you're kind of on the right and you believe in personal responsibility, this is about social and moral responsibility. It was one of Bernard Crick's core strands of the subject. This is about thinking things through and thinking about the consequences of your actions on other people. So we can sell that to those on the right and we can sell other things um, in a different way to people on, on different sides of the political spectrum. But I also think politicians are a bit daft if they kind of just think, well, education is just all about the past, you know, and it's history's great and we need maths and science because we want to prop up the economy and we need every young person to be ready for work without thinking about the fact that they are the voters of the future and the best voters are the ones that do it in the most informed way. Otherwise, you get the chaos we've been ha having. And it's just like, you know, we really do need a big kind of conversation about democracy at the moment. And as I said, I kind of believe education is the building block for a good democracy. And probably that needs to be the whole population at the moment. There's so much so much that's wrong, but yeah, we've got to start somewhere, haven't we? I'll take Titus and then Nick. Right, thanks. Um, could you say a bit about the role of the Parliamentary Education Service and whether it could do more to promote citizenship education mm. among MPs as well as more generally? Yeah, they, I mean, Parliament Education Service are a really lovely bunch of people and we work closely with them and they worked with us to support some of our events and, and continuing professional development activities. And it feels like they've got this huge resource, but they are quite constrained. A, because they are effectively civil servants, and B, because they can't do anything political. So for example, during the general election, when we were busy galvanising schools to run what we call parallel elections, i.e. run exactly the same processes as happened in a general election with your students and then analyse the results with your students and compare them to your local constituency where your school is based and do all the things from registration to vote to the analysis. Parliament can't do that because you're working directly, in a sense, with information about political parties. So they have to run mock elections with pretend parties and that's fine it serves a purpose but it's not as good for us as a parallel election making it really real so they do have some constraints but i would say they've done a lot and i think they're starting to do more and they're starting to work with us in new ways which is encouraging um, but i also think if you're an organization and you feel you want to work with parliament just ask for a meeting and go and see them because they're usually open to it so I think there's doors that are that can be pushed open a bit more. I mean, a question from Nick at the back. <clears throat> kind of post Brexit, post Windrush, this whole issue of kind of citizenship. There's still a sense of well, we're citizens, they're not. How do you deal with that in terms of essentially it's inequality? We get treated a certain way because we're in the group somehow, mm. and then a human that's next to you is treated markedly differently just because they don't meet arbitrary kind of categories, categorization. How do you kind of deal with that, especially if people in, in the class yeah. will be deemed as non-citizens and then they'll be learning all of the in inequity that they'll be subject to? Yeah, well, we do need to have those conversations openly and we've always talked about citizenship education being for everybody. So regardless of your legal status, whether you have a passport or not, and what your passport says, if you're living and working in this country, then you need education in how this country works. And, of course, other aspects, European citizenship, global citizenship, if you like that phrase, you know, learning about international and global issues, international human rights law, um, and other things. So, but we have to have those conversations openly with children about inequality and poverty, and even very, very young children engage with that. And it doesn't, it doesn't make them scared. Actually, it opens their eyes up and helps them deal with the things that are on their doorsteps. So we had a fantastic example of a primary school who took part in our Active Citizenship Awards scheme 
which is a new award scheme we launched last year. And the children and the teacher talked about what issues they wanted to focus on in their action project. And she gave them some quite nice sort of, what she thought were nice sort of primary friendly topics. But the children wanted to tackle homelessness because they had homelessness, homeless people outside their school gate and they felt concerned about it and they wanted to do something about that inequality. So they did a whole long piece of work and invited the London Mayor's team in and the local councillor and the local MP and presented their work and their argument was we need more education about finance education and drug education because that seems to be the cause of why these people have become homeless. And so if we can tackle those... These were eight-year-olds doing this stuff, and we were like, this is fantastic. And it, you know, with the right teacher and the right support, uh, this sort of thing can be done, and, and difficult things can be discussed. And what's, what's uh, a problem is when I think teachers are too frightened to tackle them and put them in the too difficult box and won't allow discussion. Um, and there is a worry that we have sometimes when we hear of the very didactic teaching approaches which seem to be being pushed in schools at the moment without allowing children to really open up and air tricky issues and do the research and do the critical thinking and look at the different possibilities and the solutions. And as long as we're giving them and opening their eyes to the possibilities and the solutions, I think we, we're, you know, we're about hope and that's how it should be. Thank you very much for that. It's very insightful. And can we have another round of applause? Thank you. And what I really liked about that was how we were able to see some of the rationale and context for the subject. I think it allows us to see it in terms of its entirety. So if Jan and Iris could help me by pushing a couple of copies of our books along the aisles. I'd like to tell you how we went about doing that. So for us as an organisation with tons of legal expertise and knowledge, we wanted to make sure and empower educators across the country to make sure that they were able to have these discussions with their students, that they could criti critically contest whether or not the law was just in particular instances. And around 2014, we had a number of educators coming up to us to say, International law and human rights is being added to the citizenship curriculum. We haven't had any initial teacher education on this. We've not had any supplementary development on this. What can you do with Bingham Centre? And in our first educational intervention, we put together these books. The Key Stage 3 book, Understanding Justice, and the Key Stage 4 book, International Law and Human Rights. And these books, were supplemented by audio-visual material and some videos that were uploaded to YouTube, as well as a number of expert interviews with leading academics and practitioners in the field. The sorts of issues that we tried to cover would both map the Institute's expertise in international law, whilst at the same time trying to bring these implicit ideas of accessibility and relevance into the classroom. So we would look at situations of armed conflict involving many of the situations that are still discussed in homes today. Stuff around the Iraq war, there was a, an annexation of Crimea that was very topical when these books were being put together. And bringing items that are currently in the news into the classroom has always been something that I think is a really powerful means of delivering citizenship education. One of the ways that we've tried to get students to think outside of their own context and put themselves into the shoes of people who are very, very far away often is using examples of issues that affect children. And by using research done by previous institute researchers around the International Labour Organization, child labour and forced marriage, we've again managed to have many critical conversations to put students into the perceptions and perspectives of people in disparate situations. And we've never shied away from examining some of these so-called sacred cows in international law either. One of the really powerful activities that I think the second book discussed 
was whether or not the inequality between nations in the UN's decision making results in a group of five who are the ultimate arbiters of international law and justice and those who aren't permanent members of the Security Council who are essentially listening to decisions decided by the five permanent members. Access to justice has always been one of the Bingham Centre's core priorities and we've had a range of activities across the books discussing when people should be given funding for legal representation and advice, how the individual victim of torture or somebody who's been in the jurisdiction whose head of state has been put before the International Criminal Court can actually get redress in what's a very disparate route between the tribunal and the individual. And we've examined in the <coughs> how there are substantial barriers for people across the world such that the OECD think about 40% of people who need legal aid can't get it. And just thinking about some of the research that I've come across in this role, the access to justice conundrum really is quite stark. Researchers at UCL have suggested up to a million civil justice cases aren't brought each year simply because people don't know that they've got a legal problem. There was a drop off of hundreds of thousands of cases when fees were introduced to the employment tribunal. And reading the 2017 judgment of former Bickle trustee Lord Reed, it seems as though many of those cases involve very complex issues of harassment and discrimination. Those who most need the support of the employment tribunal. We have, and this is something that Hugh's going to talk about later, talked about the universality of human rights. We've heard about Abu Qatada, we've heard about the cat, and human rights seemingly protecting people who are said to be socially undesirable or don't deserve them. So, as a radical organisation, we always push the envelope. We had David Anderson, QC, the former independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, looking at how the Special Immigration Appeal Tribunal, which is a special kind of court that deals with immigration cases that involve an aspect of, of supposed terrorism, enables their human rights as defendants to be protected. And again, Going to a school in Macclesfield to talk about the human rights of terrorists is one of the most challenging but ultimately career-defining things that I've had to go through because it's, it's really questioned some of my assumptions about all of this area. And I'm very glad that our colleague Ivano Alumna was able to join us today who's going to be running a very important existential conference, if you will, on climate change soon. These are things that young people seem to ensure that older generations, and uh, it seems bizarre saying it as a millennial, but my big role model at the moment is Greta Thunberg. <laughs> and I, Gen, Generation Z, those who were born with mobile phones in their cradles, seem to ensure that climate change is an issue. And we've tried to capitalise on that interest by making that one of the live issues that we discuss in the classroom. All right, so, modeling good pedagogy, we're gonna do a bit of an activity. <laughs> All right, so, forget St. Paul's, forget London, forget the UK, we're going to the imaginal fictional country of Kersia. And you're all 13, 14-ish year old Maria. All right. So, Maria, you're, you're a young woman in Kersia, an imaginary country that's experienced 20 years of conflict between <coughs> the government and anti-government forces. Before the conflict started, your country, Kersia, had public institutions that were improving. Unfortunately, since the conflict started, the government's resources and efforts have all been diverted to fighting the insurgents and without central administration, public services are crumbling. Bits of this activity have been taken from a load of different jurisdictions and uh, that was perhaps from the UK. 
most of the young adults in Kazia have not received any education as most of the schools have closed down in the conflict and for those education centres that are still open you have to go along really dangerous routes. So that's the public services of Kurzia. In terms of its judiciary and its courts, Kurzia has a court system for dealing with civil disputes and to hear criminal cases. However, after decades of conflict, there are few lawyers and judges with the expertise to administer to the law, and because of economic factors, they've all gone to the capital city of Kurzia. As you can imagine, the concentration of expertise in the capital has made the lawyers charge very high fees for legal representation. And there's a bit of a dark side of Kurzian courts that you've got to navigate as well. Those who can afford it often give court officials money in order to get their cases heard. Unfortunately, because there's so few lawyers, there's a huge backlog of cases. And judges also accept money to decide in the favour of the party who's able to bribe them. As a result of all of that, ordinary Kurzian citizens feel that the justice system is not going to dispense fair outcomes. I shouldn't bother with it. There's a low perception that interaction with the court system will actually lead to them receiving remedies. And Maria, you've not been very lucky either, unfortunately. One day there's a knock at the door. A group of armed men who seem to be wearing clothes with the government insignia are at your door and they ask for your father to come to the door. They want to have a chat with him. They take him into the vehicle and you don't see him again. Despite the fact that Kersia has signed up to all manner of international conventions, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, those rights don't seem to extend to you or your family or anybody who's ever professed any view against the government, as many Kersian citizens do. So Maria, what are you going to do? <laughs> so if you could spend a couple of moments talking to the person next to you, talking to the people in your area about what the barriers that you face, <coughs> Maria, and what levers you can pull to try to get justice in this situation. And then we'll convene in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs>
barriers, 
And I just wanted to tease out a few of the headline problems that you think are preventing Maria from getting access to justice. Let's have a few quick fire hands. Who have we got? Go um, <laughs> so potential barriers you could face would be um, lack of access to um, media, like a, a phone itself to get onto some form of media, like internet controls. Um, and but then also perhaps lack of knowledge about potential access to an international community something like amnesty or UNICEF. so lack of knowledge about what's out there and also fear of reprisals so that's probably one of the biggest things barriers that she faces if she takes further action that could make things worse um and um what else do we get one or well, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, those are quite a few of the potential yeah. answers. And I want to give a few other people an opportunity. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think you and Keith and Spiros have been competing for the top three students in the class. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a fundamental issue in that she's a child. Mm. Yeah. Um, no child can level the playing field for themselves. And where are the adults who are going to help her do it? We were talking about the need for an advocate, an ally, mm -hmm. an adult in this space. Mm -hmm. Because I don't care where you're from, children don't have agency. Can't vote, don't vote, don't count. And that's true in a lot more close to home mm -hmm. situations yeah. than Kersey. Yes, absolutely, I agree. She's also a female child, which may, I don't know, we could draw what we want to infer from that scenario, but she probably has um, uh, less agency because she's agenda. Absolutely, and, and in a situation in a lot of less economically developed countries where there's been a shortfall in public expenditure on education, it's almost always the girls who miss out, and these are likely to exacerbate issues of, of child voice as well. So thinking about the multiple identities that influence people's experiences of difficulties in accessing the justice system is again a really radical way of thinking about this, and a lot of social and legal scholars who are attached to wider work in public legal education would make those arguments as well. What what other barriers do we think there are? I mean she might also be illiterate herself. I sort of thought that, you know, if the Qatar war's been going on for twenty years, if the schools have been shut down for that long and she's fourteen, then obviously, you know, there's a very good chance that she might not just have the ability herself because she hasn't had any formal education. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we, we've reflected quite a lot on some of the power polarities at play, which might prevent her from being able to access the formal legal system. Do we have anything about the formal legal system itself? I'll just go back to a slide with the inappropriate gamble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we discussed how it might, like, she might have thought to contact the police, but actually probably decided that that's not a good idea because, um, because of the level of corruption. Potentially, if you call the police, you're raising the alarm on yourself and bringing attention on yourself as being someone who is probably anti-government and probably doesn't want to say, face the same fate as her father. So he probably has decided not to contact the police. Absolutely, and, and our colleague Matt Tron, who's been quite active on corruption in different systems, suggests that where there are a widespread system of reprisals where people expect some kind of payment for being able to go through public systems, it's likely that the police aren't necessarily friends. I think we have another hand over here. Yeah, um, and it was mentioned that Maria lived in a rural area, and also that there's been, you know, uh, dangerous kind of transport uh, difficulty so she might not even be able to have the opportunity to reach somewhere mm -hmm. to be able to talk to anyone or even pay for things before we get to the other difficulties. Yes absolutely and, and I think the, the rural isolation from the, the court and tribunal is probably one of the big causes of this four billion people we're told can't access justice and better their lives because of prevention of, of legal remedies. How are you going to get to the only court in your province if you're 50 miles away and the, the only person who couldn't transport which you've been arbitrarily detained? And right back, Nick. Also, you've got the um, distinction of if they're in a rural area, they're not going to have much money, as opposed to all the courts in the, the city where there's going to be a lot of money. 
usually if you're supporting the government, you'll be the person with a lot of money. So you've got you know, the money factor, which in most of the time, in you know, even in our jurisdiction, makes a massive difference. If you've got a lot of money, you can just bully people, even if you've got the law's not really on your side. So then in this instance as well, also the government is the police who's taken her uh, dad, so then their interest is not to let him go or be helpful to you as well. Absolutely, it feels as though the, judge, the state is a judge in its own case to some degree. Yeah. And the likely income of somebody who might, for example, be producing primary goods in a rural area in one of these countries against the professions who are concentrated in the city means it's highly likely that they won't be able to afford to get into this economy of services, as it were. So you've managed to get through all of the barriers which, behind the background for teachers, would provide the answers. And quite a few of these issues are being thought of and addressed in, in this country in a reform of our courts and tribunals where the essential end goal is to digitise as much as possible to create accessible services for all. And quite a few of the issues have been exacerbated and drawn from the UK as well as a number of other jurisdictions that colleagues have been working with and in. All right, I won't ask you too much about the second question, what solutions might be present to help Maria alleviate these issues. Students often come out with a range of many of the things I've heard talking to you, using novel campaign tools such as social media, alerting international organisations such as the UN and Human Rights Council to the situation, working with whatever NGOs actually are able to operate in a situation that sounds quite constrained and thinking creatively beyond the legal system to any of the other options. Can they put together a group of people who on, on election day threaten the government so much through a new political party or a new movement that they think they have to change? And that's the sort of space that citizenship and the rule of law operates in where there is a contested notion of what it means to exist in an equal and fair state, actually giving people the opportunity to campaign, to repeal laws that they feel are unjust, so that we're able to push the needle towards a better world through legal activism. So one of the big, I suppose, contributions to my thinking in this area is, is an article in the um, it's, a, it's a Latin word, isn't it? Who? Geographica. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the geographical journal. Yeah. <laughs> the geographical journal. <laughs> <laughs> where, where Hugh, Professor Starkey from the Institute of Education, talks about the status quo versus utopia and the journey that citizenship education can take students and people considering these issues in, where they start to think about how the world can be made better, rather than having the existing status quo which drilled into them, and how inventive citizenship education will exist in that latter utopia space, rather than having people by roads learning about the world as it is. And that's really been one of the driving factors for the approach that we've taken to the MOOC trying to have the traditional conceptual <coughs> aligned to the radical that often engages with the realities of people's lived experiences in the way that we discuss law. So I would very much like to have you take us through all of that and we're going to hear an exciting presentation about his work in this area. Well, very hard to um, to live up to that, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, Michael asked me to uh, talk about uh, why it's important to take a cosmopolitan approach to citizenship and human rights education. So uh, I want to talk about education for cosmopolitan citizenship. Now, I stand four square with Liz. I'm a member of ACT, have been for, for years. 
totally supportive of, of, of everything she does. This isn't instead of national citizenship. Cosmopolitan citizenship is, uh, if you like, complementary to education for national citizenship. But um, if we talk about cosmopolitan citizenship, we, we think that there may be a tension, but that isn't necessarily the, the, the case. The reason I like the word cosmopolitan citizenship rather than global citizenship, global citizenship is, is very often used um, particularly by NGOs and, and, and intergovernmental uh, organisations. But where I come from as, uh, uh, as a pr professor within a, a, a university, clearly what I'm doing is bringing together research and scholarship to inform um, the way in which citizenship edu education is conceptualised and, and, and delivered. And if we think of the word global, um, actually there is no theoretical literature on global, I, I, I don't think. Um, Globalisation, of course, has, has loads. Uh, on the other hand, cosmopolitanism, now that is a serious concept um, that uh, political scientists, philosophers, and, uh, and so on um, have, have, uh, have, have dealt with. I'm thinking uh, people like David Held, uh, Kwame Appiah, uh, Martin Nussbaum, Amartya Sen, Ulrich Beck, um, Mary Caldor from, from LSE. And Mary Caldor um, did, uh, uh, made a, a very helpful, I, I think, um, <coughs> definition of cosmopolitanism, which she said it's an ideal that combines a commitment to humanist principles, by which I think she means human rights, humanist principles, principles and norms, an assumption of human equality, with a recognition of difference, and indeed a celebration of diversity. So that's where I'm coming from in, in defining cosmopolitanism. Um, and I then immediately see in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, a document that is founded on a cosmopolitan perspective. It talks about all members of the human family. That's a cosmopolitan perspective. It guarantees that all human beings have equal dignity and equal uh, uh, entitlement to fundamental freedoms. So that is a cosmopolitan perspective. So it's not surprising that, for me, human rights education underpins citizenship education. So cos cosmopolitan uh, citizenship education, um, I, I, I uh, started to explore it when we talked to uh, some young people in, uh, in Leicester, where I, I was working at the, at the time, uh, many years ago now. But um, the young people uh, shared narratives uh, about their, their families. And like many of us, um, they had uh, relatives in uh, all, all continents. Uh, that there was nothing that really necessarily gave them uh, a sense of Britishness as being more important, more salient than a number of their other uh, identities, which is exactly what, what Michael has said and what, what I feel. And by talking to these young people, getting them to talk about their communities and, and their relationships, we found that they were developing a strong identification with their local neighbourhood, very much, uh, that, that, that was very salient but also a recognition of our common humanity, a sense of solidarity with other people all over the world, and an ability to make connections. So working with this uh, thought about citizenship that should not be just national, but also uh, cosmopolitan, we uh, defined citizenship as being based on a feeling, a status, and a practice. So uh, citizenship, as a political and, uh, and sociological concept, essentially based historically in, uh, in struggles against tyranny. Uh, the the uh, Americans and, and the French particularly recognize that. Citizens are people who are vulnerable. Um, they need provision, they need protection. We depend on, on, on each other. And citizens have agency, that is to say, they are, uh, they are entitled to act to uh, make the world a, a, a better place. Um, I find it useful to actually compare um, the situation in this country, where schools are uh, 
supposed to be inculcating fundamental British values um, with the situation in France where they have a slightly different uh, perspective. So in, in France, they have a constitution and it's the Fifth Republic and it's based on secularism and human rights. Uh, in England, we don't have a written constitution. Um, we have a kind of vague, uh, we, we have uh, precedents. I mean, that, that's not to say we don't have a constitution, but we don't have a written constitution which actually uh, gives the, the values uh, that underpin uh, life in, in British society. So in, fr in France, patriotism and, and human rights go together. To be patriotic is to be uh, to recognise the importance of the French Republic, and all national symbols refer back to 1789, the French Revolution. Marianne, who's the symbol of France, she wears Phrygian bonnet, um, which is the symbol of the struggle against tyranny. Citizenship in France is based on rights, and the Republic is the main source of of, of identity. So in in France, we see. Uh, they, they have uh, institutionally a cosmopolitan perspective. Um, they, the, the Constitution is based, it, it references the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It, uh, it, it, it references also the Convention on, on the Rights of the Child. Sorry, the Republican values, um, uh, as articulated by the French Ministry of Education, recognise the UN Convention on, on the Rights of the Child and, and, and the Constitution. In England, these fundamental British values um, were actually, as I understand it, written on the back of an envelope by a work <laughs> experience person in uh, possibly the cabinet office um, somewhere around 2005 and got kind of passed around and ticked off and uh, nobody had the uh, background, uh, the theoretical p p perspective to actually challenge them. And so they've kind of uh, been uh, passed on to us as democracy, the rule of law, mutual respect and tolerance and individual liberty. These are very passive way of, of thinking about things. In, in France, they, uh, uh, Republican values include active citizenship, the fight against social inequalities and prejudice. Um, these are kind of much more active and, and collective ways of, of, of representing it. So cosmopolitanism doesn't seek to deny the local uh, but, uh, uh, and, and regional identifications, um, but it's at the local level that we have opportunities to practice our citizenship uh, mostly. Um, I think my most recent um, paper on uh, uh, education for cosmopolitan citizenship notes that we have um, also, as, uh, as Michael said, a, a much less optimistic, uh, and, and I think Liz said this as, uh, as well, a much less optimistic uh, political climate than uh, the, the early 2000s. The politics of solidarity and hope is often derided, um, and those who have suffered the negative impact of globalization, economic crisis, and austerity policies are urged to put our people first. So uh, the, the response is, is, a, is of, of populism. Uh, populism. What we're experiencing today in, in the UK and globally, I'd say, has frequently presented as a crisis of democracy. Um, I would put it as a crisis of citizenship, um, that is to say, uh, the, the way citizens I I interact with, with each other. And just finally, to, to say uh, from Amartya Sen's de definition that cosmopolitanism is the antidote to restrictive ethno-national identities that promote violence. So uh, cosmopolitanism is a global uh, per perspective um, that enables us to, to, to think about it. Thank you very much. So that was quite a, a wide ranging and deep exploration of many theoretical notions around cosmopolitan citizenship and you've left us with a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. Have we got any immediate reactions? John? Well, I'm interested there's a distinction, I, I'm new to this field, but I'm interested there's a distinction between British citizenship education and cosmopolitan citizenship education, and you described that completely. I, I would have thought they'd be one and the same thing, rather naively, I guess. I mean, I thought a, a school child today 
the most a very plausible experience of citizenship would be joining a school strike for climate, which could hardly be more cosmopolitan and global. So uh, how come we're getting two different presentations? How come there's no one subject? Right. Okay, so, so I, I think you're, you're absolutely right that, um, uh, as I said at, at the beginning, we're talking about complementary perspective on citizenship education. So there, is, there are some assumptions out there um, that a citizenship education should be about Britishness, should be very focused on, on the national, which is also the case in, in France as well. But because, uh, what I'm arguing is that because in France, the national Republican values reference the Universal Declaration, you've actually got a, a theoretical framework there that encompasses the cosmopolitan, whereas in, in Britain, actually, often the reference is empire, isn't it? You know, um, and, and so it's kind of a backward-looking, nostalgic uh, uh, approach. And we we know that when teachers um, have tried to demonstrate to Ofsted that they are promoting fundamental British values, loads of primary schools. There's article uh, on this in the London Review of Education, which I edit. Loads of primary schools put up posters that include things like um, London buses, Winston Churchill, the Queen. Um, <laughs> just the sort of thing that you'd find in a tourist shop um, and they say well, oh these are British values fish and chips you know I mean really um, so it's not to do with values at all but so, so there's a lack of understanding we, we need to help people see that, that there's a wider framework out there. And Omar on the back. Hi Omar Salam, Society David Lawrence. Isn't the issue that um, though not necessarily about the understanding, but about the actual constitutional differences between the UK and France, and the fact that, that there's a there's a shared kind of conception of, 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 of certain rights in France that isn't reflected in the UK's constitution. Um, and so it's quite a deep kind of problem to fix, I guess. Right, and, and, and hence uh, British people, uh, you know, teachers, your average primary school teacher who hasn't done citizenship education at, at, at university may be a bit muddled because there are there are very few clear guidelines about what uh, what the values underpinning um, Bikou Perec is, is very good on this. But, but wouldn't they be right to be muddled in the sense that they, it, it is actually a muddle in, the, in, in Britain, you know? And so it's not really a, a okay, they can't so understand it any better. Fantastic. You know? One of the things that I, I think is, is very powerful in, in, in Britain and, and that I, I, I like uh, above the French is the notion of creative ambiguity. Um, and that we actually find ways round things, whereas the, the, the French tend to ask for Cartesian clarity and, and define it. Uh, uh, and and when, when you get that, then that sets up antagonisms and, uh, uh, and conflicts and so on. Whereas I think that the, the British Constitution they have ways of, of working around things, which we've seen actually remarkably uh, over the past six months, actually, in, in, in the way the parliamentary system adapted and use the Supreme Court and, and, and all sorts of things. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I found that particularly interesting. So I lead an organisation bridging the gap between young people um, and politicians. So um, one of the things which I really wanted to pick up on is that um, so I'm originally Mancunian and coming down here to London, selling this idea of cosmopolitan citizenship education may seem a lot easier. But when I go to the likes of the Northeast and I start to talk to young people there, um, even just ordinary, ordinary people there, I find it, um, I think what this Brexit vote did do is, is certainly show that our ideas of what being a British citizen is differentiate massively. So I wonder if you've done any research into um, the difficulty of selling this on a regional level um, <coughs> and the disparities there. Okay. Um, I, I think it, it's a it's a question of, of, of talking it through whoever you're with. So although the young people I work with in the initial research were from clearly very diverse backgrounds, and I've, I've worked in schools that are you know, um, much more white, uh, uh, effectively. Um, and so I, I know those kind of difficulties, but you, 
you have to kind of introduce it. So let, let's say Sunderland uh, and Nissan. And, uh, I mean, surely you know, the whole economy depends on um, a just-in-time economy that invokes all. So the economic system is is uh, cosmopolitan, if you like. But then the people associated with it also are. And we are not living in, we are all dependent on each other. And so helping people to understand how the economy works, how the local economy works, <coughs> and why um, uh, you know, the mines have closed and, and uh, new industries may or may not have, have, have emerged <coughs> is, is very important. But basically, people, you know, what this is about is, citizenship is, is about struggle for a better world, I, I, I would say. And, and everyone wants that, I, I think, wherever they're starting. So we have to help give them a bit of hope and a, a bit of a, a utopia to, to, to aim for. Yeah. I think Ed and Titus and Nick. <laughs> maybe we can take the, the questions as a, as a conjoined bunch. Hi. To what extent, in terms of um, cosmopolitan citizenship education, you look at barriers? For example, uh, I mean, there is a hierarchy of nationality, and we have the wall that Trump is building, and we've got walls around the European Union, and there is a very steep hierarchy of nations. I don't know if you know the passport index, which um, we've actually slipped, mm -hmm. it, but we're near the top. And, Palestinians are near the bottom. Right. So, guy, whilst I remember it, can, can I just start trying to <laughs> answer that? So, I mean, there are clearly international perspectives, and that puts the nation state as, as the most salient feature. Cosmopolitanism is not internationalism, it is person to person. Okay. It's about people relating to other people, irrespective of those national barriers. Now, of course, the national barriers are terribly important, but a cosmopolitan perspective actually enables us to go above those national barriers. Because, of course, rich people in poor countries are likely to uh, have class interests uh, with rich people in, in rich countries. All right, then one more question from Nick, and then we'll move on. Um, well, <clears throat> even though the system between the UK and France is different, and there's this element of kind of you know, human rights and cosmopolitan you know, in the French system, as you said, they're still not doing a great job. If you look at the banlieue you know, <coughs> and you know, La Reine, you wouldn't make that film if it was a utopia. It's a dystopia in the sense of you put all these people on the outside of the Paris and give them very poor access to the centre of Paris. You, you create an us and them culture. Well, just think what we could do if we have our British pragmatism <laughs> aligned with a sense of those values and, and uh, international and, and cosmopolitan values. What a difference we could make to education in, in, in this country. I, of course, I, I agree that uh, in many respects um, that the, the French have not got it right, no, absolutely, but um, we can learn from them, nonetheless. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you. So quite a few of the things we touched on there talked about the experiences <laughs> of citizenship education of different groups and regions and localities within England. And that's something that we've been thinking about quite a lot in our delivery of this program. Something I read recently that really made me think was, was an article by our inaugural advisor, Lee Jerome, who's at Middlesex, who cited John Rawls in saying that the question that the Greek and Chinese philosophers were asking was, how should I live, when in actuality, in cosmopolitan and democratic citizenship, we tend to consider how can we live in societies together, given that there are different answers to the question, how should I live for each of us? And for me, that's really telling us to what lies at the heart of citizenship. It's not about imposing or inculcating a particular set of values. It's about giving us the capabilities to be able to live together and have these 
clashes of interest, conversation and opinion that make life in diverse societies so interesting. So in trying to get to the point where we engage with loads of different types of people, loads of different people at different levels of interest in society, we conducted a bit of an exercise using two of the main studies of social inequality in the UK, the Indices of Multiple Deprivation Study and a, another study with the acronym IDACHI that I can't remember to expand. And these essentially allowed us to pitch our programme in its first iteration and pilot in the areas of England where we thought there was the most need. And we were able to reach students in areas that don't typically get to hear about politics, law, democracy, or any of that. And these are some of the places that we've been to. Yes, there will be even more self-gratifying photos of me later on in the presentation. <laughs> You should come to know this about me. <laughs> so this is a teacher in Peterborough delivering our stuff, and this is one of our research assistants delivering to a class in Tower Hamlets. That's me in Slough, and I can't quite recall where that was. <laughs> but you get the idea. We've tried as much as possible to get out to a, a wide and uh, very different set of places that the London research organisation typically may not be able to reach. And I'm quite proud of our ability to get to many different regions in that sense. We also use those studies of deprivation to get to schools that have a number of factors that often reflect on poor attainment. And this is a chart showing how many students in schools where a proportion of students getting free school meals are. This the uh, blue section of the chart represents the amount of schools who had 0 to 20% of their students receiving free school meals. This red section is the 21 to 40% of free school meals. This really big yellow section, 41 to 60% of students, so up to two thirds receiving free school meals. And then the green and purple, up to 80%. So. On that measure, we've been really successful in, in getting to students who, for a range of, of uh, economic reasons, may not necessarily always get to hear about this sort of thing. And I think, relative to our size and ability to, to get out there, we have been able to get a good regional mix. Thinking about the fact that a vast majority of the people who would come to a meeting centre training session on this stuff, or who might get to engage with me, or where I could actually send a research assistant out or go myself in the course of the day with meetings. I actually think 32% of the schools we work with being based in London in the first iteration of our programme isn't too bad. I think it does re represent a skew and a disproportionate one at that, with 15% of the population also <coughs> being based in London and twice as many of our participants being based there. But it's slightly better than the initial program expected to be able to deliver in terms of regional diversity. However, once we began to try and expand, once we went up to 400 schools, the London skew got worse. And this is what the most recent iteration of the program looks like. Almost half of schools interacting with us being based this side of the M25. And that's, for me, a, a real soul-searching exercise to do. Why are we not able to access schools in the north anymore? Why is it that uh, a, a Brummie can come to London and forget his roots? What, why, <laughs> why have we gone from having 5% of participants in the northeast in our first programme to less than... Oops, <laughs> to less than 1% in our second iteration of the programme? And I think it's a problem reflected across civil society more generally, where there are a load of organisations based in London that can't necessarily speak to the rest of the country. During the EU referendum in a, a previous role, I was doing a lot of focus groups in different parts of the country, analysing what they thought of the government's statement on 
European Union continued membership, as well as the leave.eu mail shot to all households in the UK. And people essentially told me, there are a load of economic figures on here that don't express the way I think about my community and my interests. I don't really care if the UK represents 14% of the EU trade or 350 million a day. Just want to know what the price of bread is on 24th of June, 2016, etc. And some of the free text comments from that research said that it feels as though London has a different lexicon from the rest of the country. And I think one of the key influences of trying to do a course where you don't have to physically have people in a particular place, I don't have to get relationships over coffee once you're able to go to an event where you can all get together, is shying away from all of that geographical bias. And I think that's potentially been one of the weaknesses of having a textbook that we have to mail out different parts of the country, whereas teachers in London can get a session and get the textbook and continue their engagement and continue to the second part of the programme. And I think reflecting on my own personal journey, I've often, as a Romney who then moved to Nottingham and then eventually made his way down to London, felt a great distance between myself and the Westminster policy bubble. And I know from doing this work in a bunch of different locations, that that's how a lot of the country feels as well. So somebody who I think has done more than most others in public sector and public life to make sure that the benefits of public policy don't fall disproportionately on those who are around the Westminster bubble is Maggie Atkinson. She was the Children's Commissioner for the period 2010 to 2015, I believe. And whilst in post, she was an absolutely vociferous and passionate advocate for the, for, the, for the interests of children. I was a 16 year old when I first heard about the Office of the Children's Commissioner. And I was fortunate enough to become one of Maggie's advisors at that age. And it absolutely propelled me to do things that I couldn't possibly have envisaged including some of my first trips to London to learn a bit more about this sort of activity. So I'd love maybe to come up and tell us about how we can make this a fairer society for everyone. He's always been brilliant at making you think, follow that. <laughs> it's, he's never changed. Anyway, a bit about me. I started out as a teacher and uh, was an English teacher who was made to do citizenship education because there was a space in my timetable, and that's how I worked in 1979 when I started, and I think in a lot of places it's probably the same now. Um, yes, I was Children's Commissioner from 2010 to 2015, but before that I was Director of Children's Services in Gateshead in Time and Weir. And I can tell you why London gets most of the cake, because London's got most of the money. To run my secondary schools, at that time I got about £3,700 per pupil, my colleagues in Inner London, who were, I was in the 25th most deprived borough in the country, and my colleagues in the 24th most deprived borough in the country, who happened to be in London, were getting £6,500 per pupil at the same time. Now, I'll give you that it's a bit more expensive in London, but it's not the other three times as expensive to educate a child. It just isn't. And it hasn't changed. And for those of you who think fairer funding's coming, you'd better not hold your breath. Now, that's why the North is pretty fed up, <laughs> to be honest. But it also means that people gather together and come round the fire in the north more easily and they don't defend their silos as much in the north because they can't afford to. So actually we integrated our services much quicker because we weren't busy fighting battles with people about whether the wall should stay up between them. And one of the things that drove me to apply for the Children's Commission's job was because I considered that if, a word, if, if the, na the title of the job is for England, then you flip and well make sure that's what you're doing. So in my five years, I quartered the country. I spend a lot of time with children and people all over the place. And Michael was one of my first advisory group members, 30 11 to 18 year olds from across the nation, who came together, had a budget, ran research projects, I don't think Michael was part of the group that saw me eff and blind like a retired sailor on, on the high <laughs> swing. At a, <laughs> if you've never been on a giant swing and the first five seconds are actually falling, not swinging, 
uh, you will forgive me for being the ex-sailor um, because it was just terrifying. I don't think Michael was still part of my group at that point. That. that was epic <laughs> that weekend. Um, what I've gone on to do, because it's a term limited by uh, law to uh, five years in my case, my successor, the change in law in 2014 has given her six years, so her term is up in 21. And um, you, when you step down, what you're doing is leaving something to which you've given your heart and soul for however long you've given it, which meant that I couldn't leave it alone, really. I couldn't leave alone the notion that children and young people are equal citizens now, not waiting. You're not in a queue waiting to be an adult, you're a citizen the day you're born. And the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child applies to you without fear or favour, indivisibly and inalienably, for the whole of your childhood. Um, why would I not have wanted to be Children's Commissioner? What I've gone on to do is to work in a range of settings that continue to do that fight for the space for children to have agency and the voice and the power to try and help to shape their own lives. So I'm a trustee of the Michael C. Foundation. We've done quite a lot of work with the, the UCL and others on special needs and um, disabilities education. Um, we've done a lot of work with the Lords in particular, Lord Laming and Lord Carlisle, on um, things like should we not try and look again at the, the courts system so that youth courts are actually tailored to the stages and ages of those that they are both trying and um, uh, delivering justice to. Um, and we're getting a fairly stiff response really from organisations that think that the adversarial court system where children don't understand the language is okay. <laughs> I don't. Uh, Lord Laming's review on the criminalisation of children in the care system is something else that we were part of. Um, you know, children in the care system are over-criminalised uh, simply because they're in care. And this nation considers that in care actually translates into in trouble when actually you will have done nothing that deserves having been ripped from the heart of your family and put with other people. Um, but the nation's continued resistance to the building of children's home on my estate, which happens all over the country, um, is a continued denial of the rights of the most vulnerable children in society, who've done nothing to deserve where they are. Um, I found this, this evening really interesting because the notion of London centricity and the bubble, you know, there's nowhere else in the country where you travel for free on public transport to the age of 18. Nowhere. I speak to 15 and 16 year olds now who pay full adult fares to go to school. <laughs> Tell me why that's okay. But there is one thing that I do that's very London centric and that is that I chair a charity called A New Direction. If you've not been to Tate Britain and seen the awe-inspiring Steve McQueen Year 3 exhibition, mm. get on a bus and go. And the New Direction was the organisation that ensured the photographers were present, that the safeguarding was done right, that the billboards had got 19 layers of permission before they ever went up on the sides of buildings, and so on. But we're also the organisation that has contextualised. We're the organisation that's, that's written teaching materials, curriculum frameworks, means of making that project live through more than just the photographs. But if you've not been and you don't know about it, there are 76,000 seven and eight year old Londoners in class photographs from floor to ceiling of the walls of the main gallery at Tate Britain right now. It is astounding to stand in the middle of that space and think, I'm looking at the next High Court judge, MP, bus driver, best dad, best mum, best big sister, uh, women's football league champion, whoever, right in front of me, here and now, in this great city. Um, and we've had some fairly florid and unpleasant social media feedback from people who believe that, you know, what these children are doing is uh, actively looking at replacing the white population of this city because they can't possibly be Londoners. But we're on it, and we've taken them down, and we've banned them, and we've reported them, because that's just not acceptable. But we have a long way to go in defending the rights of children and young people as citizens if we still have people with that mentality who are so frightened of what's coming in the next generation that all they can do is translate their fear into aggression. Um, how did I work as Children's Commissioner? Well, there are 11 and a half million children in this country and I have 30 staff and three million pounds a year, which equates to about 19 pence per child. So. <laughs> 
you couldn't do much in the universal space, so you focused. And we very particularly focused on the very people for whom access to law and to justice and the equality of arms is likely to be most denied. The vulnerable, the voiceless, the marginalised, the children who lived in poverty, those with disabilities, unaccompanied asylum seeker children, uh, children who had no recourse to public funds because they were undocumented. We worked with Paul Hamlin Foundation and others on those children. Um, those facing the greatest injustices in systems that sadly, I have to say, um, made the playing field less rather than more even for the very children who need an even playing field most and who need equality of arms more than anybody else. The way I run the office, and every commissioner runs the office differently, it's a very idiosyncratic position, although its primary function now is the promotion and protection of the rights of the child. Uh, it wasn't when I took on the job that the 2014 Children and Families Act changed the notion um, and is now a human rights institution, which is fantastic. Um, I based what I did on three pillars. What does the law say about this area of childhood, if it says anything at all? What do international instruments say about childhood and the issues that we're dealing with? And is how far or how close is the UK to meeting what those international instruments say? And what does the voice of the child say about what you're dealing with? So I was saying to somebody before we came in here, when I was director in Gateshead, I pushed the council and its partners when they were looking at 2030 and a completely remodelled town centre that was going to be uh, multi-level and uh, residential and arts and culture as well as uh, commerce and transport. I said, by the time you built it, the kids who are in your schools now will be the citizens who are voting for you. So you need to talk to them first. And we pulled in the Youth Assembly and the Youth Council and the representatives of schools councils and children in care council uh -huh. to meet the leader of the council, the lead planning officers, and the lead member for planning and regeneration, which was a bit brave of them, really, because they were scared of kids. Because, as you know, children until they're 11 are absolute darlings, and then they leave <laughs> primary school, and in the summer holidays they go through a chrysalis experience and come out as monsters at the other end. And all of these were adolescents. And the leader of the council asked a very brave question, to which he got the answer he deserved, really. He said, I want you to tell me what's great about Gateshead. And a 12-year-old at the back said, it's not bloody Sunderland. <laughs> <laughs> because they tell you the truth. And central to what we're talking about this evening, it seems to me, is the voice of the child. And they find it almost impossible to lie to you when they're telling you what it is that they want from their society and in their lives as they grow. They find it almost impossible to tell you untruths, which is very refreshing and can actually be quite scary. Because one of the things that they fundamentally believe in is the centrality of a human rights perspective on what it is they want from society. If you, if you go into a school that's the United Nations Convention of the Child of the, the Rights of the Child, Rights Respecting School under the UNICEF <coughs> framework, what you find is children and young people who don't claim their rights at the expense of adults, but who see the mutuality. If I have rights, then so do you. And one of the things I will not do is rob you of yours in order to claim mine. Now, what is that if it's not at the centre of the rule of law? <laughs> it's absolutely crucial that we see these connections. The way I ran the office was that before the law allowed us to, we did child rights impact assessments on some of the really big things that were going to affect the lives of children, particularly those living in poverty or in disadvantage, or with what public health experts call comorbidities. You know, you are from a minority ethnic community, your first language isn't English, you live in lousy housing, you have no money really to put food on the table or heat in your radiators, your children go to schools that are not necessarily the best in the world, and so on and so on, and there is this accumulation of factors. So we wrote a very important uh, CREA, Children's Rights Impact Assessment, on the benefits changes that were coming down the line in the design or universal credit. And it gives me no glory or joy to tell you that everything we predicted has come to pass. We were almost banned from publishing had the government had the power, but it doesn't. 
Children's Commissioner can say and publish what the Children's Commissioner deems fit as long as it's based on evidence and based on uh, usually academic rigour. We, we brought in academic researchers to work with us. Um, we published on LASPO and the changes to the legal aid system and again it gives me neither glory nor joy to tell you that everything we predicted has come to pass. The lowering of the entry into the system of cases that were previously qualified for legal aid the rise in litigants in person who don't know what they're defending or how to do it, uh, the, the frustration and upset, sheer upset of senior court officials, including judges, who find that what they're facing is people who don't know how to argue their case and where the, it gets muddier and muddier and muddier the further through the actions you go. And nobody is satisfied at the end of the day. And that applies to family law, to civil law, and to some cases in criminal law. And we said all that when, when the last vote for our legislation was on the books and we were ignored. We worked on immigration and the rights of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children and they were some of the most harrowing things that we did. I will never forget taking a group of 15-year-old Afghan boys into the Lords to talk to one of the uh, interest groups of peers. And a peer of, I won't tell you which party because it doesn't really matter because they all think the same. Uh, who said, um, how do we know that what you're telling us is, is the truth? Where's your evidence that what you're telling us is what actually happened in your life? And this boy leaning across the table into the microphone and saying, you're looking at the evidence. I'm the evidence. And that peer had the grace to say, I'm really sorry, I shouldn't have asked you the question. Because by this time, he was a quivering wreck, this boy next to me. Because of course he had PTSD, why would he not? We were right in the thick of trying to push for a recognition by society that childhood is a phase of life, it's not a waiting room, that it's a very important phase of life, which is what drove us to do our inquiries into child sexual exploitation in gangs and groups, where we helped people to start to change the language. There is no such thing as underage sex. Age of consent is 16. If sex is being perpetrated on a child under that age, that's rape, it's abuse, it's exploitation. An underage woman doesn't exist. <laughs> so the teacher who escaped being uh, struck off the register last week, in spite of having made the most abhorrent approaches to an underage girl, seems to me to have got away with a crime. And that's been said very broadly by a very wide range of commentators. How on, what on earth would he have had to do to have been banned is what the narrative has been around that case. So there's still a long way to go. We were one of the organisations that banged the drum about school exclusions being a railroad towards <laughs> exploitation. Um, police were desperately worried about it in 2011 and 2012 when we first did our work on, on it and it hasn't got better since because you are freer now to exclude on the basis of not quite liking what this square peg and your round hole and how they fit than you were when we published. And we said all that as well. We predicted that that would happen. We looked very definitely through all the work we did on where inequalities are being created, where the rights of the child are being deliberately ignored, deliberately sidelined or deliberately denied. The United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child continues to be very judgmental of the way the UK behaves about childhood. We are ambivalent and ambiguous about children and young people, their citizenship, their rights, their voice and their access to justice. If you are in a nation where supposedly equality of arms and access to the law is one of the tenets of your society, and yet for children and young people those in poverty, those with disabilities, those who've been excluded, those in care or leaving care, none of those things apply. You have some serious questions to ask yourself. One of the things I do at the moment is I'm an honorary professor at Keele University and the bit of the university I work with is the Institute for Social Inclusion, which is multidisciplinary. Economists, sociologists, educators, uh, experts in the law and criminal justice who work together around some of the aspects that I've just been talking about in British society. For me, the work I've done ever since I was a teacher in 1979 has been about moral authority and a moral stance on helping to defend those who are least able to defend themselves. 
And I'll close with my reflections on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was 40 years old uh, last November. Uh, and it's coming up to its 40th anniversary of us signing as a state's party in 2021. It is not justiciable in UK law. What's interesting is that the Welsh have an instrument against which all Welsh-specific devolved matters must be judged if there are new laws being written about them. So that's one chink in the armour. The Scots are about to incorporate it. So that's another. <laughs> Jersey, which has only had a Children's Commissioner for two years, is also about to incorporate it. So there's another. The Southern Irish, in one of their most recent referenda, made the rights of the child a constitutional matter on the results of a referendum. There's interesting users of referendums, mm -hmm. don't you think? So we may stand, come five years from now, we may stand as an outlier in the ways in which European nations consider the rights of the child as a central tenet or judgment doorway through which you have to pass before you can pass a law about childhood. Despite its not being justiciable, it's often quoted in court cases from the bench. The most famous for me, mainly because I admire her enormously, uh, was the ZH Tanzania judgment in 2013, where Baroness Hale quoted extensively from the convention and therefore started a ball rolling that is about whether the convention should be used as a benchmark against which you judge civilised behaviour in a state's party that signed and ratified it nearly 40 years ago. Um, I'm the eternal optimist. <laughs> I'm a cockeyed eternal optimist in a lot of ways, and I do think that as a nation, when we catch ourselves on, to quote the Northern Irish, um, we do actually see that we're not doing right by our children. But a citizenship education that enables them, in a tempered, properly <coughs> educated in its broadest sense fashion, to help to challenge what's going on that is unjust in their society and in their lives, is a far better way of going about it than top-down, adult-driven, purely adult-decided and uh, directed ways of working. And that's why programmes like the one that you're talking about, the MOOC that you've just designed, the continued efforts of all of us as a community, of both educators and lawyers, to make sure that children are considered as citizens, is so vital. And I enjoyed enormously my time as Children's Commissioner. It's a fantastic role. Um, I know that my successor works just as hard as I did, and my predecessor did, to change the law through exemplification through challenge, through stating the rights of the child. Um, and I, I would hope that her successor is another in that long line of, of distinguished petitions. Thank you.